Welcome back. As we continue now the reading in the book of Numbers, we are in Numbers uh, chapters 9 through 16 now. So we're going to continue as we look forward. What hap what's happening right now is God is making his last preparations before he gets them ready to go on their first march. They're still at Mount Sinai. They finished up. The tabernacle is finished. Uh, he's given them laws and he will continue to give them laws. And what he, one of the first things we see in verses 1 through 14 of chapter 9 is the observance of the Passover. And that observance of the Passover will be an, an annual thing. It's going to, he will not let them forget that he brought them out of Egypt. And he brought them out with a powerful hand and all the miracles that went along with it. All of the plagues that he brought on Egypt uh, for them to remember that. So that is very important, verses 1 through 14. And then in 15 through 23, uh, is a, it's kind of like a generic statement. It, it, it is throughout all of the travels that they do. This is how God would lead them by the cloud and by the appearance of fire above uh, the tabernacle. So God would lead them in this way. It, 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 not only just the first movement, but it would be from then on. A lot of discussion there uh, in, those in those verses. So that moves us over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, we get the making of the trumpets. Remember we talked about the position of the tribes around the tabernacle uh, in the front guard, the rear guard, and the, in the, in the flank guards. Well, this, this is, puts all of the tribes in general proximity of the tabernacle, and this is where the trumpets, these brass trumpets would be made. And these trumpets will be, moved, will be used for things like calling an assembly of the elders or sounding an alarm for an attack could be to initiate the movement uh, to get ready everyone ready to go and eventually it will be of course as many trumpets are, are used in uh, going into battles so that would be the, the the reason for that but notice that that's a basically the signaling from the center command element there in the tabernacle to all of the outlying tribes and then from verses 11 through 36, here is the movement. God moves them now away from his mountain. He moves them up to the wilderness of Paran. It's known as the wilderness of Zin. It's actually just in the southern part of Canaan. He brings them up. He doesn't take them into Canaan. He takes them up just to uh, the wilderness there. And they're going to start fussing right there too because we have no water again. But that's another discussion real quick. So that gets them up there. Then the murmuring begins in chapter 11. Okay, they start fussing, first of all, about the manna. They, they've had this manna now. They've been eating it for about a year, and now they want some meat. Now we want something to eat. So they start arguing with Moses, and Moses has about heard all this argument he wants to hear, and then the Lord's anger then gets all over Israel, and Moses basically kind of gets afraid of God, but in turn, he gets he gets frank with God as well, and he said, remember back whenever, by the way, when he was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, God said, go down for your people are corrupting themselves. So he had to go down and straighten out that where Aaron had made the, the you know, the, the golden calf and whatever. But here now, if you read verses 11 through 15, Moses tells God, these are your people. You're the one that brought them out of it. You, this is yours. And he said, if you're going to do this with me, just go ahead and kill me now. And so Moses was a little bit upset about that because he was dealing with all of their grumbling. Well, this was also making God mad. So he in turn, uh, he in turn had to deal with Israel a little bit later. And one of the points here, if you look at chapter 12, verse 3, God spoke of Moses' humility. And you go back now to this verse 15 back up here. He did not want, he wanted to be killed because he did not want to see his own wretchedness. And notice that the humility of him, just don't let me see my own anger with these people. So that's kind of interesting thought there in, in, uh, in why Moses wanted to be, well, God, just go ahead and kill me and get me out of the way of this. So then we go into verses 16 through 35. Uh, God in turn, now he brings 70 individuals from the leaders from uh, the different tribes and he puts a partial spirit on them 
that's on Moses. Moses has got a tremendous spirit, but he takes partially and puts a little bit on all of these 70 so that they can basically control and lead the, uh, the tribes. And then Moses questions God about his, about providing meat, you know, and God says, well, is there anything too small for me or too big? So anyway, here comes the quail. We read about all the quail and while the, while the meat is still between their teeth, their teeth, they wind up getting uh, a plague that comes on them. God, and Moses has to intercede. And then we move into chapter 12. Here's where Aaron and Miriam, they are the ones that get into it with, with Moses. And they challenge him and uh, God straightens them out really fast. And Miriam winds up with leprosy and has to stay outside the camp now for seven days. So that is kind of a small thing there. Um, you know, chapter verses three, basically um, through 16 on that. And so that, that doesn't get too big, but we get into something a lot bigger in chapter 16 with Korah. In chapter 13, Israel now is up at Kadesh Barnea. They are already south of the land of Canaan. And here's where Moses sends the spies. All 12 spies, including Joshua and Caleb, uh, they get the bad report when they come back. The 10 of the spies come back and say, we can't take this land, although it is a beautiful land and got a lot of fruit and food, but, the, but the, the, the sons of Anak are still there. In other words, the giants are there. And so we get this bad report. Now we move into chapter 14. And what we see here in verse 10 basically is the congregation wants to stone Joshua and Caleb. And so God gets really upset with them. And he decides in verses 11 through 38 that he's going to destroy the whole nation. Get beside me, leave me alone while I destroy these people. And Moses had to intercede yet again. And he does. And in verse 29, God pronounces his judgment on Israel. And he said, the first generation, this generation to come out of Egypt, will not enter the promised land. So that generation will fall. And by the way, later on, we'll find out that Aaron and Moses are not going to make it into the land of Canaan either because of, of, of their disobedience. But as it is, only Joshua and Caleb will lead the second generation, the sons and daughters of this current generation, to go into Canaan. But that's not going to happen now for another 40 years because he has declared that the courts of shall fall in the wilderness. Which moves us on to chapter 15. Uh, we see the laws and offerings and the breaking of the Sabbath. And uh, in verses 1 through 31, laws and offerings, we get additional instructions uh, from that which was given to us in Leviticus. And in 32 through 36, of course, the man who picks up the sticks you know, on the Sabbath day, he is, he is seen, he is caught, he is caped, taken to Moses and Moses pronounces what God said and he shall, and that is a, as punishable by death. And so the man was put to death and that is an example then for everybody else who might consider breaking the Sabbath. And then in verses 37 through 41, it doesn't seem like it would be all that important, but God has them to put tassels on their garments to be able to remember it is a is for a memory this is kind of like uh, parents putting a string on a child's finger to remember to bring home your lunch lunchbox from school or something it was just a little memory aid to remember that i am the lord your god and every time you look at this tassel that's what you're going to think so why that's put in there i i guess it's because of just absent-mindedness sometimes then we move finally into chapter 16, and this is the rebellion of Korah. So Korah, Dathan, and Abram, they all challenge Abram, um, Moses and Aaron for the priesthood. And there's a little jealousy going on here, but God, when you read through the rest of this whole thing, this whole chapter, verse 16, that uh, Korah and Abram and Dathan and all their families wind up getting destroyed. The earth opens up and swallows them up with their families and all their belongings. And by the way, God was going to destroy everybody else as well. And there was an intercessory thing. Aaron and Eleazar had to uh, take up their censors and intercede with God to, uh, to put a plague in check. And so he did. And there was some 14,700 that died as a result of the plague that followed that incident. So we see again, Numbers is a very busy time, a book that, that records a lot of events. 
And from the beginning into the end of Numbers is really representing, representing the whole 40 years of the wilderness wandering. Because I, right after this, uh, we're going to get the Deuteronomy, which would be the second giving of the law, and then Joshua as the occupation takes place. So we're still very, very busy. Uh, we'll be back in the next video here, beginning in, verse, in chapter 17 and working through 24. So hope you have a, a good read here. Uh, it's very busy. And may God have uh, his blessings on the reading of his word.